Hello and welcome everybody to this session about energy improvement with superheat control during the Danfoss Cooling United event. My name is Jörg Saar. I am in the global applications team in Danfoss Cooling. Let's look at the refrigeration system. You all know how that looks like. We have a compressor, a condenser, we have expansion valve, and we have an evaporator. And if we draw that system into a log pH diagram, you find that we have this diagram here. If we want to make a system quite efficient, there is the possibility to play around with superheat settings so we can reduce the superheat setting quite often. When we do that, we get a little bit of an increase in the evaporating temperature and that helps us to have a more efficient system. The question is, of course, how much can we reduce the superheat? Several tests have been done in the past already. And as you can see on this graph here, there is a best superheat when you reach the optimum efficiency. When you go below that superheat, the efficiency decreases again. Here's an explanation why that is. We look at an evaporator here. The evaporator is filled with a mixture of gas and liquid that evaporates in the evaporator. At the end of the evapor evaporator, we have an area where we generate the superheat. And in this case, gas leaves the evaporator. We have a dry gas leaving the evaporator, a stable superheat of let's say five Kelvin. Down there, the blue curve is a superheat measurement. Now we reduce the superheat and we see the superheat is going down. We still have enough superheat generation area here to produce dry gas. And this time the gas leaves the evaporator with a superheat of let's say four Kelvin as an example. Let's go and reduce the superheat even further. Now the refrigerant leaving the evaporator is a mixture of gas and some droplets. What happens now is that the droplets hit the wall of the pipe leaving the evaporator and evaporate there. And that gives instabilities in superheat measurement. So the superheat measurement goes up and down whenever a droplet hits there and evaporates. And that's the point where we should stop reducing the superheat because now we are unstable droplets leaving the evaporator now we should increase a little bit again to come back to a stable superheat but for the purpose of not doing that let's go and reduce even further just to show you what can happen if we reduce the superheat even further many more droplets come out of the evaporator here and all of a sudden, when you look at the superheat measurement, that can look like it is stable again. But now it is stable wet gas leaving the evaporator, which is not good. So it is misleading. You don't have dry, stable superheat. It is really misleading because many, many droplets come out of the evaporator. This stable measurement can come from sensor tolerances because now we have in fact zero superheat, but the measurement can come from sensor tolerances. If we reduce even further, because you think you are you are on a stable dry superheat, then you get real, real a lot of liquid out of the evaporator and that needs to be avoided. How to avoid that? We come to a theory that has been developed and that theory says there is an area where you have the possibility to have a stable superheat control when you have dry gas coming out of the evaporator. And when you reduce the superheat further, droplets come out, you can no longer really measure something stable and you can no longer control something. In the 1960s, 70s, many measurements have been done and a theory has been developed, which is called MSS, which stands for Minimum Stable Superheat. That theory says that every evaporator has a certain curve. And that looks like this one on the left-hand side of that curve. You cannot have a stable control. On the right-hand side, you can have a stable control. 
that curve looks different for every evaporator. It depends on the load, on the evaporating temperature, on the airflow across the evaporator, on the evaporator design, so the coil design. It's really kind of a fingerprint for every evaporator. This curve you see on the screen is just one example. But in general, they all look somewhat similar because you need more superheat when you have a higher capacity in general. How to control the ejection of refrigerant into the evaporator? Well, with an expansion device, for example, a thermostatic expansion valve. You know how they work. You have that expansion valve. Here's a cutaway. And on the upper side, you have the pressure coming from that sensor bulb, pressing downwards. From the lower side, you have evaporating pressure and the spring pressure from the superheat setting. When the bulb gets warmer, you get more pressure on the upper side. It presses down and opens the valve. So more superheat gives more valve opening. That principle leads to the fact that a thermostatic expansion valve has a linear curve that you can see on the screen here. The more superheat you get, the more the valve opens until it reaches maximum opening or rated capacity. Then you have a little bit of reserve capacity left. And then you come to the point when it can no longer open anymore. Now let's take this linear relationship and put it into that diagram with that MSS curve from the evaporator. Then we would have something like this. Here we have a stable superheat operation. We operate in that stable area. We can control that pretty easily. But as you can see, there is a distance between MSS curve and the superheat curve. So the superheat setting is a bit high. Stable, but a bit high. We could reduce it. Let's do it. Let's reduce it. Well, that was a bit too much of reduction because now we are in an area where we can have droplets coming out of the evaporator unstable control. That means we need to increase the superheat setting a little bit again. That's what we've done now. And now we have a really good superheat setting close to the MSS curve. We have good utilization of the evaporator. We have a safe operation. We have a good efficiency of the system. The expansion valve you see here on the picture is a Danfoss TU expansion valve, quite a unique expansion valve in the market. To get some more information about that expansion valve, here is a short video about the TU valve. There is a background music usually in that video, which you can not hear now probably. So enjoy approximately one and a half minutes of calmness and enjoy that video with a few tasty information.
and welcome back. Hopefully you have had enjoyed that video about the thermostatic expansion valves TU from Danfoss. There are electric expansion valves available as well. They come in different shapes, sizes, and they have all one common principle that they need somebody to play with. And that somebody is a superheat controller. So you have a superheat controller that drives the expansion valve. And that superheat controller needs a couple of sensors to get an idea where the operating condition is and to do proper calculations. The picture you see here on the screen is a Danfoss EKE1 superheat sensor. And the expansion valve is, of course, located ahead of the evaporator. And after the evaporator, you have the pressure sensors giving the signals to the superheat controller. Then the superheat controller opens and closes the valve. That superheat controller, the EKE1 and other Danfoss superheat controllers, they have an intelligent algorithm which is able to try to find the lowest possible superheat all the time. That means going as close as possible to that MSS curve. And this is done in a way that the superheat controller constantly tries to reduce the superheat until it starts to become unstable. So when the first droplets come out of the evaporator, then the superheat controller says, okay, okay, that was too much. The superheat is too low. I need to increase that a little bit. And then the system is running stable again. Well, after some time, the superheat controller says, you know what, now it's running stable all the time, but maybe I can reduce it a little bit further. Maybe something has changed a little bit and, and now I can have a lower superheat. And it starts to try to reduce it again until it comes to the point of instability, increases a little bit again, waits and tries to reduce again. So that's the play, the game that's going on all the time to get as close as possible to the MSS curve all the time to reach the best superheat. Electric expansion valves, they have two design principles. One principle is PWM, stands for pulse width modulation. Another design principle is the stepper motor driven valve. You will have the possibility to see two videos now shortly explaining how which valve works. This time you're going to hear me talking whilst these videos are playing and then you get some information how these valves work. Let's start with the stepper motor valve, the example of a Danfoss ETSC, so the ETS Colibri valve, a very compact hermetic valve. Here the valve opens and you see the inner parts. There is the motor, there is a spindle that you can see. And that spindle is driven by the motor going back and forth, opening these expansion holes here where the refrigerant expands. There is of course, uh, as mentioned, a very compact design. So you can get quite a lot of capacity into that valve. Here is a, a short, uh, sequence from the production of these valves showing that they are laser engraved. That means whatever is written on the valve stays there and does not get away. So you find what valve that is after years even. The other principle is the PWM shown in the next video. An example of that principle is the Danfoss valve AKV. And that valve works like a solenoid valve. It opens and then it closes here now again, then it opens again. So it opens and closes all the time. And depending on how much of the time the valve is open and how much of the time the valve is closed, that's how you adjust the capacity of that valve and can do a superheat control as well. This Pulsating injection helps to have a really good distribution of the refrigerant in the evaporator, and that helps to get the oil back, especially in larger systems like you find them in supermarkets with a centralized refrigeration system. And the design principle helps to get some feedback from the valve. So you can find out 
quite a lot of things from how the valve is operating and you can use that to control the system itself. As a summary, there are different expansion devices. There are capillary tubes. I have not been talking about capillary tubes or fixed orifices because they have no moving parts. They cannot adapt to changing operating conditions. That's why here we focused on thermostatic expansion valves, which are really reliable, cost-effective solutions. They can adapt to changing operating conditions and these thermostatic valves, they are really good for systems who have small to medium variations, like most of the applications that are out there in cooling units. Then there are these electric expansion valves and they have a controller. So they, with that, when you have an intelligent controller, they can self adapt. They can try to find the lowest possible superheat and can adapt to large changing operating conditions. That means these valves are really good when you have constantly changing conditions and when you have, for example, variable speed and variable capacity compressors. That concludes it for this presentation. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you got some interesting information and we are looking forward to talking to you in the chat now. Thank you very much.